Um, so uh, I'm just going to start. Um, today we will be having a presentation from Dr. Shaswar Karim Zadeh um, it, regarding the situations of imperialism and its ecological impact globally. globally. Iran's ecology and environment is being ravaged by the Iranian regime's exploitation of its natural resources. This present, his presentations will explore the changes in the region's ecosystem and microclimate and circumstance under which those changes have occurred. The concept of um, nation states will also be explored in these presentations. Um, it will explore the um, not only just the tangible borders and spaces that, that frame our perception of the earth and the roles that we as communities and as individuals partake in, this presentation will also aim to cut through the divides formed by nation states and understand how that which affects Balochistan, Luristan, Kurdistan and Iran has and will impact its neighbours beyond. Um, here we might be able to truly analyse and interpret the damage of imperialism and capitalism and how democratic and federalism poses a solution, but also how allowing self-determination and understanding the um, systems of other nation states that are oppressed by Iran wish to pursue their rights to self-determination. So Dr. Shaswa, if you would please like to introduce yourself um, and also to begin your your uh, presentation and also thank you very much for uh, agreeing to do this presentation today. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this meeting. I think it's a very, very um, um, important meeting and essential in particular, you know, in our region. And thank you all the friends that okay, I've, uh, I haven't seen and it's been for quite a few years that I've seen Estella and Kana, uh, it's good to see you all. Um, well, they, um, my presentation is, I think, is slightly broader. And I'll start with um, a very brief background, very brief background of Baluchistan. For those colleagues and friends that uh, maybe they have, haven't heard of Baluchistan. And then they then uh, focus on the issue of ecosystem and the impact of colonization in particular um, on ecosystem in Baluchistan. Is Baluchistan is um, one of the nation which is in within the plate of Iran, and the area approximately is comprised I would like um, uh, five hundred sixty thousand square kilometer. It's quite large area, and we've got coast coastal land of something like. 1,300, 400 kilometers. What is nowadays okay is uh, okay, some people to say it's a Persian Gulf or some people say it's Oman Gulf, but it's basically Baluchistan from northern part is all of the Baluchistan. So there is no Persian on that side anyway. Um, so that one is really, really important in that sense. Um, also, Baluchistan from 1666 was an independent nation. They had their own state and rules and regulations and contracts with the uh, major uh, nation, surrounding nations or neighboring nations. Until the British went and occupied Baluchistan in 1839. And then uh, British divided Baluchistan in three parts. They drew two lands. One land is called um, Goldsmith land which taken the um, western part of Baluchistan, which is nowadays to what is called Iran, and before it used, used to be called Persia, and the eastern Baluchistan remained under the control of British until 1947, until the uh, British, they gained their independence. And there is, they drew another line, the British, um, and gave a part of the northern part of Baluchistan to Afghanistan. Um, it was in um, 1890. 1890s and that has really the, had major impact on the ecosystem as i'm going through in a minute on ecosystem of uh, of baluchistan Re remember baluchistan like the baluch uh, people like, like kurdish people uh, they're very close to all the all the nations actually in that region very close to the um, land their environment uh, when there was a, such a major changes um because of colonization, because of industrialization and so forth. So they were very close to the uh, land. But since then, because Baluchistan has been okay, divided and occupied, and nowadays, okay, by um, part is controlled by Iran, 
and parties controlled when the British created Pakistan um, it's, and part in Afghanistan. So there is no really, from the start, I have to say, there is no independent body really to look after the environment. And since Baluchistan is the area of the Baluchistan in such an area that um, environmentally is very, very vulnerable to changes in the climate and all that, um, you get a drought because some parts are very, very dry, some parts are, can be very cold and so forth. So um, because there is no independent body, because Baluch people are not in control, they haven't got access, or if they are they organize, let's say, um, environmental organization, they've been taken and basically they disappeared and killed. So it's very hard really to have exact impact of colonialism to see the colonialism in Baluchistan. But what we can see, there, there have been few events, and these events, I think, highlight that what happened in Baluchistan. I just go, you know, one by one, just I've, I've chosen, I select a few major events that had major impact on Baluchistan ecosystem and environment, and it's as a result of colonialism. Is that something that's okay, caused by the Baluch people? One is what is called the the sewer gas. Sewer gas is is a major gas field, um, which is in eastern Baluchistan. What we call it um, uh, eastern occupied Baluchistan by Pakistan. In 1950s, okay, it was uh, discovered, and they use this sewer gas, um, the gas which is was the main field. They use that one. All the gas which goes outside of Baluchistan. And there is really nothing, even within a few kilometers of um, sewer gas, like okay, Belich people, they haven't got gas. All the rest of it, they, it goes to the Pakistanis, basically it goes to um, Punjab and other parts of the, okay, Pakistan. Now, the implication of that, okay, so people, since they haven't got okay, any access to their own minerals, the sewer gas, that what they do, the people, they haven't got any choice, you know, for, um, for heating, or they haven't got any choice for okay for uh, cooking or anything. So what they do, if there is any plants or any like tree or anything, um, they cut it and they use it for uh, daily okay existence basically. So that we basically what we have um, since then because all of that area people are using the, the trees and plants and of course that trees you're cutting the trees. Okay, and if there is kind of like not forest, but kind of like forest deforestation, and then you've got erosion of land, and the erosion of land, then of course you've got um, sandstorm, and all this affected the region, and as a result of that, of course, people are going to be affected in terms of like diseases, okay, eye diseases, the skin diseases, and all that is is quite normal in, in that region, and also being the largest okay a gas field that means nothing really left to Baluchistan. so that means Baluch could have used the revenue from the gas field or the petrol for even to protect the environment so that has been one of the major major issue as well in terms of really destruction i mean it's closely related to uh, colonialism and the colonialism that we have actually in, in Baluchistan, I mean, Kurdistan, okay, is, is very same. It's type of the, the colonialism because there are different type of colonialism. The type of colonialism that we had by Spanish and Portuguese when they went to South America, it means total destruction, total destruction, total taking everything from, okay, the, the, the local people. And remember Pakistan, of course, when it was created, it was a part of the India, two parts of the India, Punjab and Bengal, um, British, they wanted, you know, to have a base in that region, so they took part of eastern part of Bengal and western part of Punjab because they were Muslim, and these Muslim were part of the uh, military establishment of British Empire, so they created that. And that impact, because there is no, even for, for them, a base, I mean, there is no kind of identity for them, um, apart from the idea of the Islam, so they can be much, much harsher. So that was really one is a very important issue what we have in relation to the sewer gas or the uh, petrol that okay is exists. And the other thing that we have to remember, I think is to some extent is also related to uh, Kurdistan. I think we've got 
exactly the same issue, is since the illegal occupation of Baluchistan, then you have a um, liberation war. And with the liberation war, what you have, uh, the most like uh, active uh, member of the society, the, uh, the most like conscientious member of the society, usually they join the uh, liberation movement for the freedom, and uh, for the uh, okay, liberation, basically. Now, what we had ever since, uh, since Baluchistan, most of the Baluchistan is quite dry, and sometimes you don't have uh, um, rain for may maybe years and years. So you've got a you know, few um, springs, you know, here and there. Um, what the, uh, the occupying state, what they've done, it doesn't matter to Eastern Baluchistan, Western Baluchistan, but in particular, Eastern Baluchistan, Eastern occupied Baluchistan, what they do, um, and in particular, Pakistani army, they poison um, these um, uh, springs, okay, where, where there is any source of water, water supply. And of course, uh, the, the idea that, okay, the uh, Baluch parties are, are not going to be able to survive or sustains their, their movement. And for that reason, uh, of course, uh, but the, we, the, the parties are going to be affected, but in, in particular, because if there is any source of water, then, then is uh, livelihood of the local people, all those people they, they live around, and in particular, all the uh, species, okay, the, the birds and um, wild animals, they use that water. So as a result of that, you know, for the years and years, then we have that problem because not people being affected, also not is because people, they uh, use um, the water for consumption and affected either they die or they get some sort of diseases, but also they, all the species that exist in that region are going to be affected. And that has been um, for years and years, okay, since 1948, that Pakistani occupied Baluchistan is existed. And in, okay, in, in to, to some extent, the Islamic regime of Iran, they used the same sort of like um, policy to some extent whenever there was like um, a, a, a movement in, in Western Baluchistan. So that is also affected, you know, uh, to, to the large extent, the really uh, Baluchistan eco ecosystem. And, um, and I'm sure you're all aware that what happened in 1998, um, Pakistanis um, use uh, Baluchistan, not their own, okay, because Pakistan basically means Punjab, uh, the Western Punjab, which are, who are the uh, Indian okay, Muslim, because the other side of Punjab, they're Sikh, okay, so they're brother and sister, but they, they, they are the people that, okay, British used against um, um, Indian liberation movement, and nowadays, of course, they are in charge, they've got uh, the state. So they used, they had uh, the nuclear bomb, and guess what? Uh, they, they chose Baluchistan because they knew that Baluchistan is, that it is a large liberation movement there, and by the way, we haven't got anything in common, okay, with this, at, at least this um, okay, group of people, okay, we, have, we haven't got anything against them. The Punjabis, Punjabis, okay, people, it doesn't matter who, okay, the poor people, they're the same. They are the suffering. But the Punjabi establishment, military and army establishment, which has, I, I call it like a, a, a triangle death squad, which they used it um, in the British for really destroying the um, Indian liberation movement. So there's, they've got the power. So they gave them the power. Now, in 1998, okay, Pakistani, Okay, Punjabi army and military establishment, which is, is exactly what it means, Pakistan. Otherwise, it doesn't mean. So uh, they used the nuclear bombs in Baluchistan. Um, so they had the test in 1998, in May 98, and they used the term, I, I, I call it, they call it Yome Kabir, which is Arabic, you know, they pretend that, okay, them. So that means it's a good, day, big day for them. And it's the area of the Chari district in Baluchistan. What we call it Rasko. Rasko means the mountain of Raz. And as a result of that, the whole region, not just part of the Baluchistan, is being affected. Okay. Um, radioactive stuff, you know, um, spread everywhere. And we can see the impact of that on animals. 
Okay, so we see the impact of that on humans. Okay, Baluch around, okay, living around there. Um, replacement of people living there. But you could see um, uh, defects, birth on animals and human beings. Okay, like fusion of uh, fingers or toys on apart from other things. So um, plus to the fact that because of this uh, is going to have not like immediate impact, which we can see it straight away, but it's going to have long impact in terms of underground water. So underground water, there is no question is going to be affected. So by affecting the underground by radioactive uh, materials, so it's going to have the impact for long, long, long term on Baluchistan and whole Baluchistan. Um, has there been any independent studies? No, there hasn't been. There's just military. All the Punjabi military is there, and the imp okay, they don't allow anyone. So we don't know exactly, apart from the evidence that we get from the local people, that how they plant all the other uh, wild animals or human beings are being affected. And it's exactly because it wasn't something that, okay, Belush people, of course, they wanted. Belush people, uh, they want to remove all the nuclear um, materials um, from Baluchistan. So we are totally against the nuclear weapons anyway. So not just in Baluchistan, anywhere else. So that has been another really issue that we had displacement of people but not just that, we had all sorts of diseases that okay, is caused by nuclear radiation. So I, I think those people that are um, more expert in that area, they can tell you more. But the, what we see is very, very obvious that it hasn't been any different that from other parts that when you have the nuclear ex explosion or the nuclear test. So it's the same sort of like problems that existed or exist in other parts. Is exist in in Baluchistan. So quickly, because I don't want you know to take long of your time, but the few issues that I think are very much uh, related to um, uh, the concept of colonialism and ecosystem, I want to highlight. Other thing is um, um, is exploitation of um, minerals. Baluchistan is very rich in minerals, both. Uh, Baluchistan and the occupation of Pakistan and Baluchistan and the occupation of Iran and northern northern South Baluchistan to okay less election uh, um, the people the state the states are really responsible for ex exploitation extraction of minerals so since you get a lot of minerals in Baluchistan you get some um, in different parts of Baluchistan they come and one, the, the first impact, of course, is going to be the environment. So you don't know that whatever the chemical they use um, for extraction of uh, minerals. And in particular, now there's, okay, they brought the Chinese. And that area controlled by the military, one, you displace the people. And in one part, like 15 kilometers from other side, they dis displace the people for the, just for the Chinese to come. Okay, this is really a lot like uh, the Pakistani for the Chinese to come by helicopter, by airplane, and take whatever they want. And of course, extract ex extracting minerals, you need certain chemicals to extract. You need waters. You need so uh, how they are going to get rid of the all day, okay? Um, how they are going to dispose all the chemicals, okay? Or contaminated like water they have. Um, is a mystery basically. Well, it's not mystery for us. We do, we know that what they did. Okay, of course, they, they, there is no such a thing as health and safety or environmental issue for them. So that means Baluchistan is that part. As I said, is large part of the Baluchistan. They've got a lot of minerals. They use it. The minerals, all sorts of minerals, from gold, from uranium, all sorts of stuff they have. And there is no even one single report to suggest that. Okay, what they do basically, we just see them. They come and they take the resources and go. Um, another issue that recently, I can't say recently, maybe in the last in you know, 20 years, okay, it's been one of the major issues in Baluchistan. 
And as I said, Belucci studies got cost land about something like 1,300, 1, uh, okay, kilometers, which is start really basically from Karachi to Bandar Abbas. Both Iranian regime, the Islamic regime of Iran and the Islamic regime of Pakistan, well, they sold the um, Baluchistan Sea. Okay, what they call it, Persian Gulf and Oman Gulf or whatever they call it. But it's basically it's, it's, it's what we call it. Um, um, we call it Daria Oman. We call it Daria Macron, sorry. So the Macron is part of Baluchistan. Macron is a large southern part of Baluchistan. Um, so by basically sailing the sea or renting the sea to Chinese, most of the um, fishery industry, which was controlled by the Baluch, really destroyed. Because what the Baluch they had, the small, small boat or something well reasonable enough you know, to go on fishing. But nowadays they cannot really fish because you've got these uh, trawlers from Chinese and they catch any species. And okay, you have to remember in China, almost they eat anything. Okay, so the species that they were protected by the Baluch because, okay, they don't eat them. And also, the, of course, they didn't have access to the deep sea. No, this they, that, this guys, they come, the Chinese they, guys, they come from Karachi to Bandra Abbas or even further. So they catch anything, they clear anything deep sea species. So that has been a major, major environmental disaster in that region, not just for the people. Of course, most people, they lost their livelihood. And remember the large number of the village population is their main livelihood, source of livelihood. It comes from fishery. So these people, they're forced and some of them to go to really deep Indian ocean. And many of them, they were captured by um, um, Somali pirates, by the way. And since they haven't got any state or anyone, they kept for many, many years, some of them maybe for 10 years, eight years, because nobody cared about them. And it's because of it's first time that, that these people, they go that far in order to fish, you know, for their livelihood. So that is, has been another, like, we've got major demonstration in, in Gwadar and the problems, okay, the issues that, okay, in also in Chabahar and places like that, okay, because we've got a lot of, uh, ports in Baluchistan, which mainly they're controlled by uh, uh, colonizers. So it's another thing that means the ecosystem of in even marine system is being destroyed by okay because of the colonialism, this deep sea fishing and so forth. And the other thing, okay, that the Punjabi establishment of Pakistan almost like I mean is very well known. Even the American they said in 1970s they can sell the mother for money. Uh, what else they do? Um, we've got the migration of birds or other species from Siberia. When it's very cold, they come to Baluchistan, and there are certain bird, uh, the birds, they come to Baluchistan, and is apparently is, is something that okay, the, the 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 Arab Sheikh, okay, the rich Arab Sheikh, they quite like this one, you know, for hunting, and of course they bring them to Baluchistan for hunting, and also these birds are up almost to the point of extinction and all the other okay, the mountains animals and they're quite different types of the animals that okay if you wanted then i can get the names for them and the species so there is another fact so this endangered species also in they've been the endangered species so almost they uh, getting uh, to, to the point of extinction so again because of um uh, you get these people, they bring um, rich Sheikh Arab and for destroying the environment and the species in, in Baluchistan. Okay, historically, okay, I think it doesn't matter in Baluchistan anywhere else. Um, uh, really, women basically being very close to environment in terms of the protection of the environment, okay, protection of the land, protection of... Um, I mean, it's, it's anywhere, anywhere you go. And usually they are the people they first they come to support because you don't see any women to go on hunting animals for, for fun. Uh, but you get, okay, men. 
So there is uh, there is a point, you know, there is a serious point that I would like to make. Um, and Baluch is is not really Baluch women are not the exception. So they've been close to uh, land in terms of farming, in terms of like okay, looking after the animals, in looking after the around the environment or the species. But since of the rise of, I mean, the type of the colonialism that we've got is really really horrible, nasty. All the colonialism that nasty, but there is a there is a relative nasty horribleness, you know, in in terms of the uh, colonialism. We've got this horrible, horrible um, uh, colonial geopolitical structures of um, Pakistan, which is uh, created by the name of Islam. So you've got this Islamic um, um, state of Pakistan or Punjabi Islamic state of Pakistan, and it, uh, which are the Sunni fundamentalists. And then you've got the Iranian Shia fundamentalists. And for them, of course, we are here to be tested. You know. The more we suffer, the more we okay is better for us. So when it's, it comes to the, 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 the idea of colonialism, of course, all the suffering and most of the suffering come to us. So um, because of that, so they created this extreme um, death squads, Islamic death squads. They created this extreme uh, Islamic fundamentalism. So to forced women in particular to stay at home. So all the economic activities they had before is very limited to what they can do at home. And that has been really a major issue uh, in, in Baluchistan because we can see all these death, death squads, okay, people that are scared to go out and to know that what is going on. And that has been really a force in protecting the environment or animals and so forth. But no, there's a, because of that, it, it's been another major impact or important impact as a result of colonialism. Okay, so that, that is really an um, issue as well. I think in most places, but in particular in places that you get uh, religious fundamentalism and they, in particular they target women. Another issue that, okay, there are a couple of more issues that I just want to, uh, to go through because I, I think we're having a much time is um, since people that with, with colonialism, what with the, colonial, the mindset of colonialism is such that they try to make you dependent, dependent in every respect, um, economically, okay, politically, culturally, linguistically, so in every sense, okay, militaristically, every sense. So because of this, uh, um, the the force of dependency that they create to you, in particular economically, in Baluchistan people they haven't got most of their sources of the income. Either it's been agriculture, or it's been farming, or it's been I don't know fishery, or it's going to be um, I don't know trade is taken from them. So in Baluchistan people are really forced to do other activities, and one of the activities like in Kurdistan. Uh, what we know as a school about. And in Baluchistan is Sukhtbal, is fuel uh, carriers. And this few, okay, this individual, they have no choice apart from take uh, like petrol from one side of Baluchistan to other side of Baluchistan. But always, every day, every day what you see is they've been attacked. So when you attack petrol, so you're not just destroy the individuals, you destroy the environment. So any part of Baluchistan you go, you see the fire, you see the fume, you see, and the impact of that for years and years is considerable, which there hasn't been really like, um, okay, um, independent studies and so forth. And my last point, since there is no any independent organization, because as, as soon as you try to speak out, you've been taken, Okay, or you disappear, or you've been killed, and so forth, because there hasn't been any independent study, and is black hole in whole Baluchistan. So people really they don't know the, all the impact of all the um, uh, state policy, colonial policies on ecosystem. What we need, we, what we know that is the situation is um, extremely bad. 
so yeah, the environment we sell like is getting hotter and hotter because it's very hot area. So as it's getting hotter and hotter, so agriculture is going to be more difficult. And, and it's confiscation of the land, the fertile land, the good land, but uh, colonial, uh, the, the colonial powers. Or the area that, okay, has been quite um, um, good for economic activities are controlled by uh, colonial powers. And if we put all together, then we see that really there is kind of like disaster is going on in Baluchistan. And my last point, okay, and historically Baluchistan um, was the main source of agriculture which supply wheat for the whole region. And also in terms of like um, um, potential, I don't think there is any other region in, okay, there any other area in that region which has got that much potential for um, development and um, protect, protection of eco ecosystem. You see, we've got sea, which is like 1,400 kilometer. And also we've got what is called 120 days um, wind is, is really like very, um, fast wind that the way you get it in northern part of Baluchistan. So, and that could be utilized. And of course, we've got the sun. We've got 20, we've got like, I don't know, 15 hours of the sun. So you can utilize that one. And also the uh, seasonal rain that you get it, they can be used for utilizing, okay, not just, okay, underground, which they use. Underground is another issue that I did haven't paid, okay, I haven't said much. Um, I didn't say anything about that. But what my, my point is, Baluchistan, in terms of protection of Baluchistan environment, it's got all the uh, potential to be protected. So we thought like damaging like ecosystem in Baluchistan, you can have all the solar energy, sea energy, wind energy for um, all the economic activities. And also like seasonal rain that okay you had for economic activities. So the reason that the real the main reason that uh, um, the ecosystem in Baluchistan is being destroyed or in the process of uh, uh, being destroyed is because of colonialism, is because of that you having got a, a free democratic Baluchistan that the local people they decide. Okay, and protect the environment. They decide about the future and the protection of the environment. I think I finish at no. And if the friends they've got any questions, then later on I'm going to answer the questions. Okay, thank you so much. If if I might come in here very quickly, first of all, thank you very much, Shazavar, for your presentation uh, and for taking the time to speak with us. Um, Estella has proposed, uh, if it's okay with everyone, that briefly we open it up for for questions now. Uh, if that's all right, before our next presentation from Sonia, and then we have another round of questions and discussion after. Is that okay with everyone? Yes. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. I, mean, I understand why you focused entirely on the, the regime's oppression of Baluchistan with the limited time you had. But for us to have any understanding of the possibility for effective resistance and a, a change in that situation, we would need to know much about the liberation movement there or its, its various components. So you know, perhaps you could say something briefly about that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's a very good question. Actually, they, it's um, uh, yeah, very, very good question. Uh, there have been a lot of resistance at, um, in, in Baluchistan. In particular, there is a port is called Wada. Um, uh, demonstration in uh, again in particular women there have been a lot of demonstration for in in relation to the ecosystem and in relation to to, to um, uh, misuse of fishing in 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 that part of the world but generally speaking about the uh, Baluchistan liberation movement has been very very active in both sides of Baluchistan even now that um, you get a different political or different liberation uh, organization they're fighting and 
I think if you look at um, the, the, the news, of course, that you, you don't get the news on the uh, major media, but every day you see that, okay, they are fighting in Baluchistan, different parts of Baluchistan, and they're attacking. Um, uh, quickly, if you go on Google and you sell the Baluchistan liberation movement and their struggle, you get a lot of videos um, in different parts of Baluchistan, the people, they, they're fighting. Um, and nowadays, of course, the, you see that a lot of demonstration in Western Baluchistan, um, even the day before yesterday, there was a large demonstration in Zaidan against the Islamic regime of Iran and also attack on the Pakistani military in the last few days. So that movement is never stopped, it's always been gone. There are different um, political organizations as well as um, partisan organizations. Great, thank you. Then we also have a question from Shoresh as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to uh, raise one issue, I think, which Shah Sawar a bit uh, paid attention and highlighted. But uh, Shah Sawar uh, in Balochistan, because I uh, basically belong to Balochistan uh, at the moment, I'm in the UK. So there uh, is a big issue. There is the shortage of water. You know, the uh, colonialism due to the extremists and the uh, occupiers, they have not built any uh water dams or they have not saved the water reservoirs so the people are forced to use the solar system and they use uh, the solar system excessively and they have uh, uh what we call them bores in my language or i think they like well they dig the well so the water level is uh, gone to a very uh, you know dangerous level in balochistan so there is uh, too much shortage of water and it has affected the livelihood there as well as the, as you say, ecology and the irrigation. So this is a very concerning issue at the moment in uh, uh, both sides of Balochistan, particularly in Pakistani occupied Balochistan. If you throw uh, a short light upon this, it's okay. Otherwise, thank you very much. Yes, I think, okay, this, uh, okay, thank you, Shoresh. I think, yes, this is one of the major, major issues in Baluchistan. Uh, many kids being, you know, in Baluchistan, we've got, in southern part of Baluchistan, we've got kind of like small crocodiles. And people that protect these small crocodiles, but is um, where they collect the water, the Baluch people, they collect the water, you know, for, a consumption also for the animals but also at the same time okay these small crocodiles they live there basically so the kids when they go and fetch water because there is no any other source of water there haven't been any infrastructure for that one and they've been attacked and we had a number of um, uh, uh, the, uh, kids being attacked and killed also you know by these small crocodiles crocodiles yeah there is a very very important issue i think that the water issue is not just like for baluchistan is for the whole region and is because of the the policies that okay these states they had um in relation to water or very wrong policy they had but in, in particular in baluchistan is going to be um more crucial because of um the location of baluchistan and it's always been the lack of water in baluchistan okay thank you so much for highlighting this point. Okay, great. Uh, if there are not any more questions just now, uh, I think we can turn it over to our uh, next speaker and have another round of questions afterwards. So uh, our next presentation is from Sonia Karimi, who uh, holds a BSc in English Literature and Colonialism. She's a member of the Peace and Kurdistan Ecology Steering Group and works with the Community of Free Women of Rochelat, or Kajar. So Sonia, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shaswar, and uh, for your presentation, and uh, Connor also for your introduction. Um, I'm going to echo on some of the points which Dr. Shaswar mentioned, particularly on colonialism and its impact in the region, environmentally and uh, ecologically. Um, we do see quite um, a big operation on. Um, from both the Iranian regime and external um, nation states on the exploitation of natural resources in the region. Um, one of the most uh, 
striking pieces of information which I recently came across was um, the uh, the position of um, Iran in terms of um, where they rank in the world's most polluted um, nation state um, and which parts of Iran significant were highlighted as the most polluted. So it came as Ahwaz, um, which produces Iran's oil and is one of the most polluted cities in the world, followed by Sinindaj and Kirmanshan. And then there were a few cities in Baluchistan, uh, particularly on the Pakistani border, um, that came up on that list. And they were ranked number one, number four, and number five. And then the Pakistani areas of Balochistan ranked as number five and six. Um, and then one thing that was really interesting that Dr. Shaswar mentioned was the uh, fact that there's um, a limited uh, availability of water in those regions. And water is really integral for um, mining, for um, oil reservoirs, etc. So where there's no water, the increase of pollution um, and the damage to the environment and um, the ecology is significant. Um, in my previous presentation on the environmental destruction in the region, I explored the, um, the way the system of water uh, works in the Iranian region. And its uh, function is predominantly done by khanats, which were built over a thousand years ago. And they're a series of uh, shallow wells that bring the water downwards um, but then the Iranian regime, which is now considered the world's third biggest uh, constructor of dams, um, they then redirect the waters away by these series of dams. So it's not that there isn't an availability of water. There is an availability of water. It's not that they um, can't build dams. We've got, this, we've got the statistics showing that the third biggest uh, creator of dams in the whole world. The point is that they're intentionally redirecting the waterway. The point is that they're intentionally avoiding uh, bringing water into those areas. Why would they do that if it's not to commit genocide? Genocide doesn't happen simply through bombs, wars, etc. It can be more insidious if we look at uh, the um, pan-Arab uh, the height of pan-Arabism and the construction of dams that they built, particularly Mussel Dam in Iraq, uh, we can see that what they tried to do was degrade the agricultural um, integrity of the land to force the population to move away from the area. And um, certainly when you're looking at 25% of the population in Khujistan, their deaths are linked to pollution. Uh, when you look at the situation in Balochistan, where there's an enormous water shortage, the uh, lands which were once rich um, and capable of producing yearly yields of, um, of harvest are now 60% reduced. Um, and indeed, if you look at water bodies across Kurdistan region, there's a 70% shrinkage in Wurmia. Uh, of water bodies. Uh, wetlands and marshes are all being dried up. Areas that were once considered um, protected because of the ecological significance of the region are now being bombed and fires are being created by the Iranian regime, etc. But what's striking is our role in the situation. Um, as nations that are being oppressed by Iran, as people are being oppressed by Iran, uh, it is our duty to form alliances within ourselves uh, so that we're not vulnerable to external exploitation. Um, if we consider surrounding nation states around us, for example, if we have Iran on one side and we have Turkey on the other, there is actually no difference between Iran's policies and Turkey's policies, uh, when Turkey recently tried to invade a region of uh, southern Kurdistan, which is occupied by Iraq, 
uh, they deforested an entire forest. They took the woods and they took it all to Turkey and sold it. Why do we believe that if we make alliances with Turkey, they would be different towards us than Iran? They wouldn't be. They would be committing the exact same policies against us. The only way we can secure the region, the only way we can secure our resources, secure the safety of our people and secure the environment and create a sustainable future is if we work together um, and form alliances within each other, that is Balochistan, Kurdistan, al uh, the Aziri population who are considered Turks, um, you know, uh, forging alliances within ourselves is the only way we can secure that safety, particularly when we look at how um, other nation states are withholding resources and I mean, even working against nature to withhold those resources. So if we look at, for example, the Tigris River, 40% of the Tigris River is contributed by um, Iran, um, sorry, by Turkey, 51% is by um, Iran, and then 9% is by Iraq. Uh, so if we look at it like that, uh, there are certain moments over the last decade where Turkey has restricted the water being accessed and the water needs to pass through Kurdistan and it's restricted the access um, of that water coming through to uh, Kurdistan and then the water that comes through Kurdistan is then obviously going to pass through to uh, Khujistan, to um, Baluchistan, to other parts of the globe. We don't exist simply within ourselves. What happens in one area affects everyone globally. This is a spherical earth. Um, and this is why it's so critical. No nation state should have the power to cut off such a vast volume of water. Um, and they do have the capacity to redirect that water in enormous quantities daily to Basra. So if there's a water shortage in Khojistan, in Balochistan, in Kurdistan, we can be assured, we can see plainly and evidently that that is an intentional act of genocide against the population. It is there to erode the soil. It is there to create pollution. It is there to make that land non-viable. Um, and the only way we can come to some sort of manageability of the situation is if we step away from imperial powers and certainly Turkey's government has shown itself as another imperialistic state um, simply uh, through the way that it's conducted itself in Afrin and in Syria we can see that they have expansive ideologies they wish to they have ambitions to colonize far beyond the Turkish border so again structurally what's critical right now is forging these alliances within ourselves um, so that we can figure out how best to manage the situation. A lot of damage has already occurred in the region and we need to consider um, working together to, to try to fix it, try to work on it. Um, sustainability is so much better achieved within the region than it is externally. And we're not alone in the world. We're not alone um, as people who have been exploited, who's uh, suffering serious soil erosion, um, water shortage, etc. We need to work with um, other uh, ethnicities globally to further this, to highlight it, to ensure that we're doing the most that we can to create a sustainable and functional future. Um, and that's all for my presentation because a, mo a majority of what I, what's occurring in the region I discussed in a previous seminar. So this truly was a chance for me to uh, express the urgency of creating alliances in the region. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Great, thank you so much, Sonia, uh, for your presentation. Um, 
And uh, so now, yes, as Sonia said, we'll open it up for questions again and uh, discussion. I'd like to begin with a question, uh, if that's all right, for, for both speakers, actually. Uh, I was wondering if they could comment on the uh, ongoing protest movement we've seen in Iran developing over the past months uh, from the perspective of Kurdistan and Baluchistan, respectively. And uh, first, how this uh, impacts the development of a democratic alliance of peoples in Iran that you, Sonia, in particular discussed in your presentation, and also then how this relates to the ecological context. Thank you. Dr. Shasar, would you like to answer first? Yes, I think, um, um, well, this uh, protest uh, is started from Kurdistan, uh, killing of Gina, then, but of course, uh, the behind the you know, killing of Gina, it was um, this movement existed within the whole the region for years and years and years. But when it started, um, it went through all, actually all, you know, uh, parts of Iran. And two areas that are, um, this movement was much, much stronger it was in Kurdistan in Baluchistan. And in Baluchistan, it's still every Friday, you have um, uh, people that come out and um, to express their really anger against the Islamic regime of Iran, and in particular in Zahedan. Um, yeah, I, I think. Um, because the is that not it's not really the question of I think Sonia you know the, the, the indicated it's not really the question of one part of one nation um, the issue is the whole region the whole region you know you start from uh, Turkey or from Syria or the whole Middle East if you take the whole Middle East it goes to Afghanistan even or even Central Asia and so forth. Um, we haven't managed to have the experience of the age of enlightenment that existed or happened in, in Europe, um, at even for the really most basic human rights, the basic rights of to express yourself, the basic rights to have opinion, the basic rights, the rights of okay, to have to determine the, your own future, the basic rights for women, the basic rights for the environment, the basic rights for anything, almost anything. So it's the whole region. And um, uh, one thing that uh, I, I would like to um, really pinpoint is the role of um, uh, secularism that, okay, in particular that exists in Kurdistan, uh, Kurdish nation, and that can be quite, um, um, quite critical in the region, and to some extent in Baluchistan as well. But Kurdistan, of course, is ahead. Uh, but Baluchistan, and I think Kurdistan, the Baluchistan, uh, Kurdish nation, and some other nation, of, of course, um, is not just Baluchistan Kurdish, but in particular, Baluchistan Kurdish nation, they can have a um, very, very critical role in terms of taking this secular, humane, democratic uh, movement uh, forward. And I think um, at the moment we can see that. Um, and it's not surprising that, okay, we've been attacked by all the forces in the whole region, not just region, even their allies in, in West. So um, the movement that at the moment exists is not going to end uh, soon. Uh, but unfortunately, okay, the political parties, the organization that they're supposed to be there to lead this movement, either they're being taken to, they're in prison or they're being killed and so forth. But this movement exists. The one responsibility that we have, I think all of us as a, um, human beings, okay, the free human beings, anywhere, uh, a democrat or whatever is our responsibility wherever we are actually to take this movement to support this movement but because we know that this movement is not going to be supported by the western allies or is not going to be supported by the uh, powers in the region because it's not going to be their interest is not going to be supported by chinese or it's not going to be supported by russian or whatever okay so it's really all responsibility all everywhere if you find any okay a democratic movement any democrat 
it's our responsibility to to support this movement and in particular as i said the movement which goes on in Kurdistan and the movement which goes on in Baluchistan in other side of in all side of Baluchistan or all side of Kurdistan I think that's all I can say so I leave it to Sonia um in terms of um uh the protests that are occurring uh, across the region um I have to say that uh, it's if, if one positive outcome has come from it is the recognition of the importance of forging uh, a unity between all the um, different nationalities that are oppressed by Iran um, and uh, working together in that sense. Um, certainly furthering women's rights in the region is a priority, but Abdullah Ojalan argues that uh, the first enslavement occurred during the oppression of women when patriarchy uh, was forged. Um, and the second was the way uh, the nationalization, privatization of the lands, of uh, the environment, the ecology, mining, etc. Um, these two go hand in hand. Uh, overthrowing the regime is our opportunity to create, um, to overthrow patriarchy, firstly, to create a safe space for women, and for us to be able to work together on preserving the land. And that is so critical. Uh, it cannot be overexpressed because we live on that land. If the soil is not um, hydrated, if it's eroded, uh, there's no going back once the soil is eroded. Um, we can't farm, we can't produce uh, anything agriculturally. And that's disastrous if you consider the fact that agriculture came from the Middle East. Um, if we are unable to produce any, if we are unable to yield any crops, that's it for the region. Um, also just looking at pollution um truly the the only people that can salvage the situation are the people that exist on that land because they're the only people that for it truly to matter uh for the iranian regime it doesn't matter they can go anywhere else in the globe they can stay where they are they've taken all the resources but for us once those lands are dried up once it fails to yield crops once it's so polluted you can't even breathe there as you see in Khujistan. Uh, particularly in Khujistan, where they had the uprising of the first day in 2021. So truly, uh, it's it cannot be overexpressed, the need to overthrow the regime and the need for us to work together in the region, not to seek allies externally, but to work together. That's critical because uh, anybody else that comes in externally will only exploit the land. For us, it's critical because we live there and we know how to deal with the situation. So really, the protests have highlighted those things. And um, I'm hoping that it means that we will forge better relations amongst each other and be able to work to further those causes. Absolutely. Thank you very much, both of you, uh, for your responses. Um, were there any further uh, questions? Uh, I believe, Estella, did you have something you wanted to say? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Well, I want to raise a question in uh, response to the support of the Baluch anti-Kurds in European countries and remind people that the Baluch and the Kurds faced the terrorism laws in Europe and also worldwide. I mean, if people remember back in 2001, the British government issued a whole number of anti-terrorism laws. And of course, under the 74 or five organizations 
who were considered terrorists were the Baluch and the Kurds. And I remember very well from the start, you know, when we formed the campaign against criminalizing communities, our Baluch and Kurdish friend were working, were part of these groups. We held a big demonstration with the support of the Baluch and the Kurds outside the home office in November 1991. So the issue really is that we have to uh, consider to uh, bring this campaign of criminalizing communities on the scene because it is inseparable from the right to self-determination that we have to raise the issue of, you know, legitimate, you know, acceptance and the end of the terrorism laws. So the, uh, uh, so I would strongly suggest that this is being discussed, uh, maybe in a separate meeting by our Baluch and Kurdish friends, you know, how we can, with the support of other communities who are part of Kanpak, come into that campaign again um, and make it more active. So uh, we have uh, the chance, we are supported now by Garden Court Chambers in a new attempt to rebuild a uh, campaign against criminalizing communities. And I do suggest at some point to have a special discussion on this uh, with uh, our friends from the Baluch movement and also uh, from the Kurdish movement to uh, come together to uh, talk about it in more detail. This uh, just in brief, okay? I think Estella has uh, mentioned something quite um, quite uh, sensitive is the terrorism laws. Um, we're in a very difficult position indeed um, because while terrorism laws are supposed to function as a form of protecting communities, um, corruption, uh, globally has meant that certain groups have reached terrorist lists without any evidence of acts of terror taking place simply because it benefits um, trade, simply because it benefits uh, uh, global alliances. This has put us in a particularly interesting position where I've seen uh, in British Parliament a group who are recognized as a Mujahideen group have set up an APPG uh, with lords and uh, MPs supporting it. Um, and yet other groups are in a position where they're unable to make those lobbies because they're considered a terrorist organization. Um, so yes, I, I agree with you. So we do need to discuss that, and but how we approach it needs to be tactical in terms of whether it complicates an already disastrous and terrifying situation in the region, or whether you know you need to consider timing, you need to consider tactics, and etc. In that situation, uh, but yes, definitely a discussion on it wouldn't harm anyone to find out what everyone else thinks on the situation. Well, it can be an unofficial meeting between all, uh, our Baluch friends and the Kurdish friends who want to participate in this. But as I said, uh, there is definitely an attempt by barristers and lawyers now to keep raising this issue on a much broader scale, okay? and to uh, challenge it, you know, with different tactics and means. Okay. Uh, I believe we have another uh, speaker. 
or a person who would like to ask their question with the hand raised? Um, yeah, with regards to um, the environmental movement and ecological damage through colonialism and a need to work together as different regions, I just wanted to make a comment on the state of the environmental movement uh, in Europe and in perhaps the quote unquote West. One potential change that I think I can see happening in the environmental movement currently is that there is a shift from seeing oneself as a part of uh, the system here and, and taking solidarity of people around the world on that basis to a realization that uh, this system has completely compromised our own societies here um, as well. And I think with, there's an increase in consciousness of the kind of degree of extraction which is taking place against communities across Europe, um, mining for resources, building new coal mines, building unwanted developments. And I think there's an increase in consciousness amongst communities in Europe um, that they too are completely compromised um, by the system and its extractivism as our communities around the world. I think the, the significance of that is that communities uh, around the world and peoples around the world, whether in Kurdistan or Baluchistan, can work uh, a lot more strongly with environmental movements uh, in Europe and in the UK um, on a joint basis. And since in Europe and in the UK, of course, uh, these groups constitute the majority, it means that they're important allies in the campaign for uh, decriminalization um, as well. And it's also worth remembering that recently uh, environmental campaigns have started to become criminalized as well and um, branded as uh, terrorists uh, as well. So I think the campaign against criminalization can definitely involve such uh, communities and for Kurds and Baluchs who are in the diaspora here. Um, I think those communities are very important to work with for, for those reasons. Uh, okay, I believe we have a question next from Mahmoud. Thank you, Connor, and uh, thank you to the two speakers. I have two questions uh, and uh, comments to make. One focuses on the legal and the delisting of the liberatory movements in the Baluchi movement, uh, together with the liberatory movements in the Kurdish movement. It is absolutely vital that there be an international front with regards to that. Uh, Comrade Estella has uh, explained there's a resurgence amongst the legal practitioners to tackle that issue. And obviously then linked to that is how does the international solidarity step forward from here to action that particular type of a campaign? Because Dr. Sharosh has given us a good uh, overview of things that are taking place. So the second part of my comment focuses on the international uh, solidarity that you have, because uh, we down here in the South, in, in on the African continent, your struggle is very much on the fringe. And uh, it would be good for it to be part of all the other struggles that we support in terms of our international solidarity. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, and then we have another question or comment from Les. Yes, uh, I'd like to follow up the last few comments, I mean, especially the one pointing out that environmental protest movements here are increasingly criminalized with or without being labeled extremists or terrorists. I mean, even the so-called criminal law is becoming so extreme that it becomes less important what labels are used. So this provides another possibility for highlighting the, the long-standing criminalization of solidarity here with people in countries allied with the UK. And we could point out that the decision two decades ago to classify many of those liberation movements had many motives, and some were specific to each place, such as Palestine, Kurdistan, and so on. But a, a general pattern is that the, the alliance with those oppressive regimes, we could even say terrorist regimes, was especially important for protecting the plunder of resources from any resistance, resources which are ex plundered by either Western multinationals or procured through trade by those same companies. 
you know, for what they call economic growth and prosperity in the West. And increasingly, the climate justice movement you know, has been criticizing that whole model of, of the economy you know, as inherently unjust along race, class, and gender lines. And in, the, in, in some cases, I mean, that convergence has already happened, I mean, such as um, perhaps in, in India, which is where mining companies have been facing protests in London for a long time. So in the case of Baluchistan, just as another example, I mean, I know nothing about the, the plunder of resources there and the role of multinational companies, but that would certainly be of interest to the environmental justice and climate justice movements here. And that could be another way of making the link that has been mentioned before. Thank you. I don't know if that's anything uh, either the speakers or Shazva would like to comment on. Yes, uh, a couple of points I just want to mention. Um, one, uh, Les, I think there was um, a very good point uh, that he raised. Yeah, the multinational, the, the multinational companies, um, with, in cooperation with, of course, now with the Pakistani government, uh, the main okay, um, re the reason for their plundering resources, the Canadian and Australian multinational company in particular, and Chinese. And the second point I would like to raise, um, I think when we've got like a meeting like this one, um, the friends from al Ahwaz, they could have contributed quite a lot because of uh, the role of um, uh, environment and what happened to the environment in al Ahwaz was um, very crucial, um, was uh, the, the issue that um, they had a lot of problem in terms of the water shortage, in terms of other issues that they had so i think in future if there is a, such a thing such a meeting i think it could be quite useful if we invite you know um our, our friends and colleagues from al Ahwaz and also from i think from uh, you know pakistani side uh, Sindhis, <clears throat> they had a lot of problems and uh, the pashtuns as well so that could be uh, we get a better picture of what's going on in, in that region Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Les, was there something else that you wanted to, to follow up with the first? I see your hand is raised. Oh, well, well, that's what they call a legacy hand. <laughs> so I forgot to lower it. But, uh, but perhaps uh, sooner or later, we should think how to translate these ideas into specific actions, or I mean, that is proposals for action within the climate justice movement. You know, including, for example, Extinction Rebellion, which has a section called MAPA, the, um, from the uh, people and places most affected. So that I mean, they target the, the culprits in Britain and other imperialist countries who are you know, responsible for the plunder of the people most affected. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think that's an important point, and uh, I think part of the one of the hopes of of, uh, of the network of the of the uh, ecology network that we have here is that we can uh, play some part in trying to build dialogues between peoples in different areas around the world, including places most affected and places like here in the UK or in the West, uh, to uh, so that we can hear from them there. Uh, what kind of things we can go about doing here, what kind of things would be most helpful or how to inform possible strategies and actions. And there, uh, Shazavar's last point about uh, possible uh, inclusion of people from different places or representatives of different communities in the region to offer their perspective on uh, ecological situation in their own uh, regions and uh, continuing or developing this uh, dialogue with different peoples. Uh, would be great. So maybe we could do another follow-up uh, event at some point on that. That reminds me also to say uh, we encourage anyone here also to um, contribute any uh, possible ideas for future works or future topics for events that we can do. We um, Our next work is on um, an Africa conference, but after that we're always open to proposals. Uh, Estella, did you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I actually think it would be a very good idea if a proposal could be worked out, okay, of the issues that were raised today in writing, uh, maybe jointly by a team of people, 
including the excellent comments from Les just now, okay? Um, uh, not to forget, as I said, you know, to be very aware that never did we have so many terrorism laws, and this includes, you know, the, uh, you know, the uh, ecological movements and the environmental movements, you know, who are being affected by it, and everybody who even uh, raises his hand, you know, for some tree somewhere in Bristol, okay? I mean, it's pretty serious here. So I'm afraid we can't get out of this question. And uh, I think it would be a good idea for the steering group, which is happening on the 12th, on Sunday the 12th, maybe to discuss a proposal that uh, some of the main points could be drafted by a couple of people, you know, uh, what are the main points we need to look at, um, you know, in relation to follow this up effectively, okay? Yeah, that's just a suggestion. Great, thank you. Uh, Sonia, was there something you wanted to say? Uh, yes, um, Pajek and Kajar has tried to reach out to um, a few of the other nationalities in Iran um, uh, for many reasons. Um, it, they had their own reasons to uh, not want to participate in this one, but I do hope that this one that this meeting that we've had today can encourage them to come forward and can encourage them to see that actually it's worth it to work within the people of that space than it is to work externally um, at this stage. Uh, and our priority should be uh, the people internally rather than external. And I do hope that they that this is influential, that this encourages them to come forward and to participate in the future ones because it's, it's truly critical that we work together. Great. Um, are there any other uh, questions or comments anyone has? Um, well, in that case, I can ask another question. That's all right. Um, it was spoken about uh, briefly. Shazavar mentioned it a little bit in the discussion around uh, multinational corporations uh, in the exploitation of resources from the Baluchistan region. I was wondering if, you, if uh, both of the speakers could comment a little bit more on the uh, global dimensions of the ecological situations in both Kurdistan and Balochistan, or in Iran and the Middle East in general. Because um, as we know, uh, uh, ecology and biomes does not uh, respect the lines that we have drawn, um, that have been drawn. Um, what, uh, my, my question is, is sort of broad, but what role do you think the uh, interests in environmental aspects from international powers, states, corporations have in determining the situation in the in the regions. So, for example, issues of minerals or other things uh, to engineer the kind of uh, both governments and other things uh, in the contexts concerned. And uh, what um, also do you think that that or how could that inform the kind of actions that we can go about doing here in places like the UK? If I may just quickly answer that, one of my greatest concerns um, in terms of the region of uh, Iran and greater Iran at the moment is the Hormuz Strait, which I believe Shaswar is called something else. Um, it's a historically Baluchi uh, area um, and it's critical for the passage of cargo ships. Uh, which transport oil, gas, etc. Um, the one of the main reasons I often find that people are unwilling to support region the the sorry regime change in Iran um, is the fear that regional instability will have on the fluidity of the uh, trade happening through the Hormuz Strait. Um, and that goes to show the extreme influence that these uh, international trade organizations 
companies, etc., have on the day-to-day uh, -day life of people existing in that region. It out-trumps human rights. It out-trumps uh, the fundamental right to self-determination. Um, again, this highlights why it's so integral that we work together as oppressed people because there are certain things that you just can't fight in this world. There are certain things that you can't you can't simultaneously overthrow a regime and overthrow um, global trade in one day. You have to pick your fights um, and you have to be able to live to fight the other fights. Um, in this sense, it's critical that we stabilize that area, that we stabilize the region, particularly by working together and showing that we are a um, stable force, that we are a stable governing structure in the region. De, de facto, we can then fight this enormous influence, this undemocratic um, influence that trade has on the region, on the world globally, because it's not just in the region, it's not just in Iran, it's not just in the Middle East, that trade has a uh, uncomfortable grip on governance. Um, even if we look at the Amazon rainforest, the fact that they're willing to deforest so much of it to protect trade at the expense of life, how much of humanity, how much of ecology and the environment is going to be sacrificed at the altar of colonialism, imperialism, nation states, etc. Um, I, I think that covers what I think is important to say, but I think Dr. Shaswad might be able to explore that a bit better too. Okay. Okay, thanks, Sonia. Um, look, multinational companies, of course, some of the multinational companies, they're slightly more ethical, but you can't be a multinational com company and be an ethical you know, company because you're not um, a charity um, from the start. And in particular, those multinational companies that are dealing with um, these um, colonial geopolitical structures, they know very well um, about because the officials are very corrupt, um, uh, colonial powers, um, like you know, if you take Pakistanis or Iranian Islamic regime or Pakistani Islamic regime, um, the establishment is highly corrupt. They're, they're basically a bunch of crooked criminals. It's not something that they, do, they don't know. They know exactly, or it's the same case with, I don't know, in Kurdistan, what they do in Kurdistan. So that is not really the issue. The issue is these people don't know exactly that the minerals that they plunder, they exploit, is the cheapest they can get. I can get, I give, give you just one example. There is a, um, is a huge area in Balochistan, which, which is start from the Western Balochistan, which start actually from Kerman to the whole Balochistan, and it goes to from Western to Eastern Balochistan is a huge mine. I think it's one of the largest. And this, what we've got, we've got is Sandak, Sandak mines. So what the Pakistanis they've done, or the uh, uh, Punjabi establishment they've done, they basically lit it to um, a Chinese company, multinational companies. And what the Baluch they get? Absolutely nothing. So something like maybe 20, 25%, which goes, you know, the, after the extraction of the minerals, okay, the revenue goes to the Pakistani establishment. If there is one or 2%, they apparently they, they give it to the religious um, government, they use it for um, uh, suppression of the village movement there, you know, because you've got all the, the, the largest uh, military or Punjabi army situated in, 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 in Baluchistan, or is the same in the case of, of the Western Baluchistan. So anywhere there is, if there is a mineral, and well, no, there's the multinational companies that are not really that, the, uh, that don't feel that scared to go to Western Baluchistan, but the Indians, they use the Indians, 
and Indian multinational companies. And of course, what you're going to, to get is because where there is no transparency, there is no accountability, where there is, okay, the local people that have no saying is different nation. I mean, you just imagine the um, Latin or South America under the control of Spanish, under the control of Portuguese. So they, they don't regard you as human being, it's the resources they are really interested. And these multinational companies, they know very well. Now, the point is, as long as there is a pressure from inside and outside, and inside is going to be much, much harder because you just lose your head, you disappear. For the most basic thing, if you just go for the demonstration, you know, demonstrate that, okay, this, um, that natural resources uh, belong to the Baluch or to the Kurd or to the other uh, occupied nations, then you're going to lose your head. But um, internationally, it can be done because these multinational companies, they're scared from the international voices. And these international voices, it could be human rights organization, they could be um, general public in, in, in particular, and they could be from um, environmentalist groups and so forth. They're really, yeah, they're really petrified if there is such movement. And so long as internationally people that don't know where is Belutus and where is Cordes and what's their issues and how is their resources are exploited, um, then it's going to be a bit harder, you know, for the Belutus or for the Kurds or for the other um, nation and their occupation to really protect their resources and of course the environment uh, following that. So my, my, my point is, um, uh, what I'm saying is we shouldn't expect from the multinational company unless they are very, very ethical, they come up with um, um, a plan which is transparent, accountable in terms of paying their tax, in terms of the, where they're going to invest their money, where they get their money, and that this is a, a very long and difficult demand for the multinational company. You cannot be really multinational company unless you've got some secrecy, unless you've got, okay, you can get your resources as cheap as, as possible. But human rights for them is not really a major issue or even, as I said, even if they're really ethical, it's going to be a secondary issue. So you, you can easily bribe any packet, you know, Punjabi establishment army to do whatever you want. So as long as it, it doesn't belong to them, they can do anything they want. Or the Islamic regime of Iran, if we want to survive, they can do anything you know they want. They easily they can rent or give um, what the, let's say Persian Gulf to or the sea there to the Chinese to do whatever they want as long that, as they can survive. So the multinational companies really, maybe they in West, there is slightly more rules and regulations, okay? They ask them for certain, I don't know, um, information, data to provide, you know, to the, to the local government. But, you know, if you've got a Chinese or if you've got, uh, I don't know, um, Russian multinational companies, or and there are many up all. If you've got the Turkish multinational companies, or whatever, then of course there is no nothing to do with these issues. And other multinational companies are to some extent in West as well. They are not really interested in the human rights in Kurdistan, and Belarus, or in Africa, or in Asia, or anywhere else. You know, if as long as they make um, um, a huge uh, profit. And their shareholders are quite happy with that, with dividends that they, they get. They, they don't give a damn to us. So I think it's at the end of the day, is us, um, the nations which are occupied or colonized, the people of those nations, and all the decent um, and democrat people and human rights organization, other um, environmentalist organization that we can do something in order to highlight, you know, what's going on in, in that region. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. I think no. if I may, just one other thing. I think it's also the over-reliance on uh, unsustainable resources. Um, there are so many uh, alternatives that are just being overlooked. 
um, because these multinational companies don't think they'll find a profit in it. Um, last month in the UK, um, they did a vote in Parliament to reopen a coal mine, um, considering coal mines have been closed for 25, maybe longer years uh, in the UK. Um, it, it's not just a step back. It shows that, and, and this year alone, considering the pressure on the government, uh, the cost of living crisis, etc., in the UK, um, these oil gas companies made an £84 billion pound profit uh, in that respect. Um, and they're still wanting to open another coal mine. Um, it just doesn't seem as though as if there's a way, I mean, it would have to be really radical in a way to make this stop, in a way to make these multinational corporations stop, because there doesn't seem to be a diplomatic capability to make them see the damage that they're causing to the world. Uh, I think that's it. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, one one thing I just wanted to to say uh, from primarily from uh, Shazavar's point um, was that what what came to mind for me was a uh, another reminder, you can say, of the fact that we still as a species live at the global level under a regime of neocolonialism. Um, as you know, I'm sure as you know as you all know when when Kwame Nkrumah theorizes neocolonialism, it's to say that in that era transitioning out of the period of national liberation struggle, the uh, constellation of ruling powers transitioned to leveraging primarily economic forms and tactics of power in order to uh, continue to expand and consolidate their control over, expanding control over uh, the goal of the entire world. Um, and they do so, we see in, in the history of all the states that occupy both Kurdistan and Baluchistan, uh, that whenever there's local, regional, nation state level movements uh, that gain some traction to try to turn away or break away from that regime uh, and from their desires, they're overthrown or marginalized or suppressed through sanctions or, or whatever it is, manufactured coups. And we see this ongoing today at, at a rate as, as high as ever before. Um, and, you know, the ecological situation that we that we are in is, uh, is of course, in, in no small part that's responsible for it. And, and I think that this really speaks to the point that Sonia has been, been emphasizing in particular about the need for, for alliance of peoples to come together in order to uh, build a resistance of people who dwell in these lands and to, to begin um, expanding capacities for exercising self-determination and, resi and resistance against uh, external exploitation. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions or, or comments from anyone. We are, uh, I'm, I'm conscious that we're coming slowly to the end of the two hours here. Um, so I suppose if, if no one else has any comments or questions or, or uh, if the speakers would like to make any final comments, we can begin wrapping it up. Okay, I'll take that as yes. So, uh, oh yeah, Shazavar, please. Well, well, just, I mean, the, the last one that, okay, thank you so much for, for this, um, uh, the way you organized it and uh, uh, for the the comments made by Sonia and all the other colleagues and friends. But uh, my last point is uh, um, because of this ecosystem is a, a major, major issue um, and is going to be even much more important, really. Um, it could be part of like we can integrate the struggle for protection of environment to um, resistance movement, to liberation movement. I think is maybe this is um, one area that we can maybe spend more time um, in terms of the organizing of people, uh, in in particular move, uh, the women movement because they can, as we see, uh, as we saw it in in recent movement in in, in Iran, um, as leading.
были до, до изменения. 